So my name is Robert Exley. Uh, I'm a filmmaker slash journalist, uh, video journalist, I would probably call myself. But I'm also, I don't restrict myself to only video. I try to do print, a little bit of photo and video. Please yeah. listen to me carefully. Yeah. Okay. The mayor agreed yeah. to come. He, she received a call from the police intelligence to say it's not safe for her to come anymore. Wait, 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 no, wait, 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 Shame on you, you know, you built on this land illegally uh, without paying a cent. It's a textbook definition of theft. What uh, utter nerve that can you have uh, to, to use your own families uh, for emotional manipulation when you know yourself uh, that you stole this land? And by the way, now that you're being compensated, where's that money coming from? It's coming from the Israeli taxpayers. Making this film has really pushed me as a storyteller because if you look at my previous work, like I've gone out of my way to find people that are completely different from me that I, that I don't really see myself in their story so I could just tell their story. And this forced me to like turn the camera inwards. So I had to have like very real conversations with my dad and my mom and I had to look at parts of my life that I, I normally don't talk about. You know, if you start Right here on the shoulder, this represents me, the convict. All the tattoos I have, um, either I earned them or they truly meant something. I didn't just get ink on me to get ink. Yeah, this is a pecker wood, a yard bird. Uh, I got this up in San Quentin. These are lightning bolts, and the way that you get them is you're supposed to uh, try to kill somebody. Is, is basically how you, you earn them. You put in work. That's what work is. Prodigal Father is a film about, I mean, I guess in general it's about my family, but it's about my father who was a heroin addict for over 20 years. He spent, I believe it was a total of 14 years in prison plus a bunch of time on parole. So the film kind of explores not only his past, but also the effects that his past had on our current lives and our future. That was my dad, Bobby. Robert, turn around, let me see. And I'm Robert let me Jr. See. Show the point to the blood. Growing up, I always wanted to be like him. Whoa. Everyone called me Little Bobby or Little Robert. I used to dress like him, do my hair like him. We went everywhere together. Once a week, he'd take me to buy candy and I'd go with him to the methadone clinic. One thing I loved about my dad is he was always very honest about about his, it's a terrible way to say it, but his love for heroin. He, even to this day, if you ask him, he'll say that he loves the way it makes him feel. And like when, when doing it, like if you ask him about the first time, he remembers vividly what he was listening to, what he did the first time he shot heroin into his arm. Um, so for me, it's always been interesting to hear people to like talk about drugs because I've, I mean, it's been such a part of my life for so long. And, and I remember, uh, uh, going upstairs to, to my dad, and man, I was a basket case, and I had a problem. I had a drug problem, and I knew I had a problem. I remember going into the room and, and him looking at me going, what's wrong with you? And I remember uh, putting both my arms out, and I had needle marks going up both arms, and I just told him, I need help. I said, I just need help. I, I, I think I'm a junkie, and I don't know what to do, and I remember my dad breaking down and crying and going, oh my God, it's my fault. It's my fault. It's hard, I mean, when your dad, especially when your dad's in prison, because, like, he's supposed to be the breadwinner, and, like, if he's away, gone, he, he would send us what money he could, but, I mean, they don't pay people in prison. I think he's, he had the good job, and he was making 25 cents an hour or something like that, like, as a welder. And, like, I mean, it's rough. Like, 
there's six of us and like we would we had food stamps which covered the food but like housing like that's we sometimes we just wouldn't have electricity or water like that was just a, a fact of life for us and like I said my mom did her best she could but I mean it, it was it was hard and it affected all of us in our own ways yeah my family's always horrified because they knew the life we were living and he was a crackhead heroin addict and they were horrified every time we left they felt bad that you kids we're going into that life, nothing normal. It made my parents sick. That was one of the hardest parts of the film I didn't anticipate was interviewing my mom. What I didn't realize is how it affected her. Like, cause I mean, when we talk about, we laugh and joke about how fun it used to be when we were kids. And she went through a lot of like real pain, like raising us and she did hold the family together. And one thing I didn't know how to put in the documentary, I didn't get it in. Um, and like, I had to add subtitles because she has like, um, it sounds like she's deaf when she talks. Sorry, mom. Um, but like, it's it's very hard to understand. For some people, it's not hard to understand, especially on the phone. But it's because the last time my dad was in prison, she went in for a dentist appointment, and they found a tumor in her mouth, and it was like a golf ball-sized tumor. So my dad was in prison. She was working, um, I believe, two jobs at the time. She was working at Sam's Club and as a maid, cleaning houses and taking care of. I mean, it'd be six children at the time, and and they had to cut out the whole roof of her mouth. Dad always loved all of us and wanted us to have a good life, but he was broken and Dad was in charge of it. When I asked my mom why she stayed with my dad through all the, all the things he put her and us through, and she just said that she genuinely loved him and she saw the potential in who he could be. And um, she, even with her kids, I feel like she has an ability to do that. She sees the good things in people and she was there with my dad like when, when people didn't understand why. As she knew like deep inside there was this great man who was gonna help all these people, which later on went to be true. My dad now runs a small church in California and is known for helping people who don't fit in anywhere else. That's, that's because we worked out a deal. Now, I'll tell you what changed me is uh, the last time I paroled, my wife was telling me that my oldest son, his best friends, were two black kids. And I told her, well, that's going to change. And uh, I said, you know, I can't have that because of who I am. And I went on this whole big spiel and all this drama. And I'll tell you, I remember uh, paroling from prison, getting out and going home. And I had a deck, and I used to sit on that deck. And I remember watching him play with those two little boys. And they were climbing up in our tree, and they were laughing, and, and they were playing tag. And, 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 and it was just, it was like an epiphany. It hit me that those little boys laugh at the same thing my little boy do, does, and, and they cry over what he cries over, and, and they're no different than me. How can I hate them when I love my son? And if my son loves them because they're his best friends, there's something that needs to change in me. Now he's Pastor Bobby, and I'm the preacher's son. Both can feel a little weird at times but I can't complain knowing what could have been.